either I can move up here or I can be buried up here. <laughs> so bizarre. Don't you think this is weird? I said it's like the Loretta Young show. <laughs> Do you think if you weren't a filmmaker, you would have been an interior decorator? Um, I might have been an architect. I wanted to be an architect I when I was growing up. That was my big deal. So you know John Lennon said he would be a hairdresser? Yeah. I thought maybe interior decorator. I wanted to be a hairdresser. Gay. Yeah, I'd like to be a hairdresser too. Really? Um, now, do you remember when we, uh, I wrote the young Indiana Jones thing with you? Mm-hmm. And mm -hmm. we both had these. Matahari? Hey, f you! Yes. You're a That's always the best way to write. Hey, you're talking to me! <laughs> I think... I'd, I'd always write these beautiful e romantic lines. No, but and that was... And your opinion of my romantic line was, uh, and is I in that little... That, no, but we would, I remember that we both took them and... With I the, would take those it away was, from you. No, but you had it also. We were both going like that yeah. and doing... We, no, we both had them and we I were would, both... I would grab it away from you and... Well, the Send thing is, you. you you wanted to write, and I believe it, it did end up this way because, you know, you're George Lucas and I'm not, which I only realized this morning, which was upsetting. Um, <laughs> Uh, you wanted to write, your eyes are the colors of diamonds that glow. Nah, come on, it wasn't that bad. It was pretty... Well, it was very flowery. It was very anti-ironic uh, uh, and, and modern, cynical it, it kind was, of dialogue. It wasn't hip. It was... Uh, it was very 40s. It, well, but I mean, was, the was... weirdest 40s in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what, I mean, the notion of sort of heroes now... Uh, whether, you know, a celebrity is a hero, that is completely changed, don't you think? I mean... I don't know about that. Not I mean, completely the, changed. The, the issue of heroes, I and mean, we've had lots of heroes through history, you know, it's in... Uh, through history, the, the, but not lately. Well, we've, since the end of the Cold War, uh, and I guess the end of the Vietnam War even more, and in the end of World War II even more than that, uh, we have come to sort of uh, not focus on that kind of thing, uh, uh, and heroes have been taken in a little bit different light. But the human spirit and what it takes to be a hero and what it means to be a hero and what it means to care about somebody hasn't really changed. It's just that we have gotten kind of uh, complacent and uh, uh, not paying attention to the real issues. Mm -hmm. um, something like this puts everything back in focus and says, look, you know, People's sex lives are not that important in the real world. What's really important are, you know, taking care of other people and compassion and helping people and and sticking together and trying to make this a good world. Right. So that suddenly we're not all talking about Anne Hayes and uh, yeah, what's his name, Gary Condit. We we're won't. not talking about ourselves. We're talking about other people and caring about other people. Well, you do in the in the movies. You do. You're sort of everybody's heroic or. Well, there's the, there's the good and the evil. They use a lot of your language when, I mean, Dick Cheney just did it. If somebody's going to have to go over the dark side, <laughs> what do you feel about that? Well, I mean, you know, I'm making films that are timeless, and they're about issues that have been around for a thousand years. So the human condition hasn't changed too much. Intellectually, we've advanced, but emotionally, we have not advanced very far. And as a result, uh, the same kind of struggle that each individual human being has to deal with in terms of their, you know, how do they relate to the rest of the world, how do they relate to their society, how do they relate to their family, how do they relate, relate to themselves, uh, is a big issue. And it always will be. And it doesn't change. And what makes somebody good? What makes somebody evil? Uh, and what is good and what is evil? You know, and for, for young people and for you know, telling mythological kinds of stories, uh, those, one, get delineated very clearly. Right. And then at the same time, um, what I'm doing now in my next little challenge is that I'm, I'm taking 
uh, our hero, and I am exploring how he became a bad person with very good intentions. Yeah, because I've found coming to my endless age that uh, nothing is just one thing. Uh, as perhaps, I don't even know that I ever thought about it, but that uh, it takes many reasons to, you know, that nothing is purely bad or purely good. I mean, in Star Wars, it may, be, it may well be. <laughs> Well, it doesn't. It isn't really because you find out in the end that the the most evil person was actually the hero. He's the one that actually killed the emperor. He's the one that made brought good goodness and balance back to the universe. So, in Star Wars, also nothing yeah. is just one thing. So I could be right. kind of a bad chick too, as the uh, <laughs> as the good old princess. Yeah. Hey, your worship. I'm only trying to help. Would you please stop? Calling me that? Sure, Leia. Oh, you make it so difficult sometimes. I do, I really do. You could be a little nicer, though. Come on, admit it. Sometimes you think I'm all right. Occasionally, maybe, when you aren't acting like a scoundrel. So I know what they wanted me to ask you, which is, uh, you know, they, they, it says that, uh, you know, when you change the title of Revenge of the Jedi to Return of the Jedi, and... Uh, you know how a lot of people now are sort of saying, well, let's get vengeance for what happened. And I mean, how, what do you feel about that? You know, they're saying nine out of 10 people that we want vengeance. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in terms of, uh, it'll be very interesting to see, um, not that things play themselves out in the next Star Wars film, but we, be, we do begin to see uh, how Anakin turns into Darth Vader, and it does have to do with vengeance and fear and all the things that people are starting to spout now. Speaking of vengeance, they've got something that they want me to show you. Uh-oh. Well, the databank's not too, it's still secure. <laughs> oh, I am adorable. You're so cute. Look at that. Aren't you beautiful? Voices, you get your award. You have my camera. Look what I've become. What's, you still are. Why couldn't so, I have done the Dorian Gray thing? The plans and specifications to a battle station with enough firepower to destroy an entire system. Our only hope in destroying it is to, to find its weakness, which we, we will determine from the data I stored in R2. But we captured the plans in a raid on the Imperial shipyards. But we fell under attack before I could get the data to safety, so I hid it in this R2 unit and sent him off. But I was all so insecure and falling apart then. Mm -hmm. But you didn't talk that much either. Are. I'm insecure about my uh, looks, but not about areas of my personality. I have islands of confidence. <laughs> bases, they're going to destroy the entire system. I know, Tough You know. And they're going to Death Star. But our only hope is to destroy it before it destroys us. Yeah, but you had certain areas of confidence there, too. That's why I hired you. I hired you because there was this very mature uh, streak that ran through you. And then on the other side, there was this extremely vulnerable kind of young girlish streak that ran through you. I need approval, but I'm going to tell you what to do. <laughs> it's sort of, no, I have, I know I had a little formidable thing, but, uh, well, you all, you said you hired the three of us because we had big personalities, right? Pretty much. And you were very much the characters that I was looking for. I mean, you were strong, yet you were young. You know, Harrison was kind of curmudgeonly and, and uh, you know, swaggery and, and Harrison-y. Epic. <laughs> he was. When Sorry. I saw him, he, he took up the whole space that he was. I mean, you didn't, mm -hmm. you didn't look at anything else around him. But, uh, and, you know. And Mark was very boyish and enthusiastic and... Uh, you know, I mean, you guys, your personalities very much fit the, the needs of the character. Do we ever know what happened to my runner-up? Your runner-up? She became yeah. a rock star. You liar. No, I'm not. Terry Nunn? You're trying to, she's with no, her, you'll she's never She's the lead singer in, in a rock notes. group. It's something, it's, um, Berlin. huh? Berlin. Berlin, there we go. See? Really? Yes, she's the lead singer in Berlin. You can cut that out, I should. <laughs> <laughs> well, so see, everything worked out really well.
Set two seven one. Uh, what are you doing? You're not actually going into an asteroid field. They'd be crazy to follow us, wouldn't they? to do this to impress me. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. <laughs> well, remember when I had to save you from the independent director that was chastising you on the boat? Oh. The drunk director. The drunk director. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He was, you know, the funny part of that was is that when I was on that trip two years ago, two and a half years ago, we had exactly the same conversation. And he was drunk then, too. But he, <laughs> he uh, you know, it was funny because he obviously... You've ruined, he, he said he, you've ruined he, filmmaking. Yeah, he'd been right. holding on to this idea for so long that... Um, and he really he just, wants to confront you with it, like you're the uh, only, he's the only person that's ever going to say well, that. He's confronted me twice with it, and I imagine he's confronted Steve with it, too. But it's, uh, you know, it's this... Uh, again, uh, uh, a kind of lack of understanding about the way of the world, especially the, the, the ecosystems that run not only socially and naturally, but also economically. That, uh, you know, you can't have small art films unless you have big money-making films. Because well, what he says to you that, that the blockbuster ruined the... I mean, I don't the, even know yeah, his... The, but you, the, the logic is, is that that it made the studios dumb. You know, that they were very smart and intelligent and they were doing really wonderful things in the 70s and they were allowing filmmakers to have their freedom and they were, they were promoting all these very artistic films, which is really a lot of BS. In the 70s, there was only like two or three people at each studio. I mean, it, that was it. I mean, you went to a studio to make a deal, you went to one or two people. That was the only people there. Oh, yeah. Now there's at least two or three hundred, and I'm not kidding, two or three hundred in the creative affairs department, executive vice president level of people and readers who actually make decisions on what movies get made. And what's the dumbest note they ever gave to you? I think the dumbest note probably had to be they wanted to change the name of American Graffiti to Another Slow Night in Modesto. Wow, you can't even say that six times. You know. <laughs> it was a good idea for you know, really getting people to go to a movie, another slow night in Modesto. I'd, I'd run out to see that. They kept <laughs> and saying, watch paint dry. Yeah, they said, well, American Graffiti, you know, nobody knows what that means. It sounds like an Italian movie. How are we going to sell it? Uh, you know, and I said, well, you know, it's, uh, at least it's like a trademark. They don't understand it. They don't know what it is. They'll just think of it, American Graffiti, that's what that movie is. Now, do you think you would ever direct another movie other than a, a science fiction type one? Sure. Like an American graffiti yeah, I'm, type one. I'm not. I'm going to start going back to directing other kinds of movies as soon as I finish the third one of these. But this kind of thing is a 10-year commitment. You know, it's full time, day in, day out. I don't have time for anything else. So when you're like 60, you'll go back and make I'm American graffiti so. too. I don't want to think about it that way, but I did American. Or graffiti. you could call it at that point I, a slow night in Modesto. Yes, I did American graffiti too, and it didn't do very well. Oh, that's right. So I'm not going to go back to that. But I am going to go back to other things and do what things that I really want to do. What would you do then? Uh, to be very honest with you, a lot of TV shows I'd like to do. A lot of TV. Really? Yeah. Like it's that. an interesting format because you don't get wound up in this, you know, first weekend grosses and, you know, how to uh, play here and there. And, and it, you can actually do very uh, uh, specialized, unique sort of niche programming and get away with it. And I like that. And so I'm interested in history and things. And so I'm going to do some historical TV series. Like what area and, of history? Uh, I'm interested in the Roman Empire. I'm interested in, uh, you know, more ancient. Like the gladiator. Well, that's part of it. But I'm more interested in the, in the, the, the political story that's being told through, uh, through that, uh, which is probably the you know, longest running, greatest uh, uh, sort of civilized like, government in, that mankind's ever produced. So you sort of like, is it like epics? No, it's not epics. It's, it's, uh, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, the history of Rome very much deals with a lot of the same issues that we are dealing with now in terms of contemporary problems. Such and as? I would like to be able to, to uh, you know, put that down and say, look, what you think is now a, a new and unique experience is actually something that happened 2,000 years ago, and they were coping with the same problems. 
and this is what happened. And you can, if you begin to understand history, you can see where it is going. And then you can say, hmm, if we're not careful, we're going to end up making those same mistakes that they made in Rome. The problem is today, most people don't know Roman history, so they're just repeating the same mistakes over and over again. So this would be well, a sitcom? Yeah. Yeah. No, this would it's be like... It's got talking bears and... Like a, what kind of format on television? Um, it would be a, It's something I'm going to do and then try to figure out where I'm going to get it on. So I'm going to make it first and then try to sell it. It's a very, you know, reverse way of doing things. Uh, but it would be, you know, period, various periods in Roman history, uh, the best, the most interesting periods, told from the point of view, not of the emperor and stuff, but the, you know, told from the point of view of, say, a senator and then sort of more of a uh, uh, business person, a person on the street, a uh, shopkeeper, something like that. What was the thing with girls in school? How did you do? With at which level? Well, at like I started out with a girlfriend around the sixth grade, and, and I how was had that? my heart broken. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, but um, it was uh, one of those fun things in the sixth and seventh grade. You know, where it's to very have your heart broken. Fanciful kind of puppy dog. You know, silly kind of love. It's fun to. Did you get like to run that. into her later and, you know, have her regret the whole thing that she dumped George Lucas? No, 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 no. I haven't seen her in years and years again. That's a long time ago. Although I'm going back to my uh, my um, elementary school 50th reunion. You're kidding. Yeah, next weekend. That'll be exciting. Maybe she'll be there. Ouch. Then you yeah. can get your revenge. Well, and, then, and, and how, I wasn't revenge. I mean, I no, don't, I don't, no, I I don't look at. I, You're not all a revenge of, guy. You're all, a return guy. All of my, all of my relationships, I've been very good and very um, sustained the friendships afterwards. Except if for, you do, except you for my marriage, of course, but that I doesn't know. count. <laughs> marriage doesn't count. <laughs> they, they, I don't think they count at all. Now, um, now, now, you've got me so confused because you said, oh, now here's what I wanted. How are you at sports? I'm so confused that you work out. I didn't even know that you worked out. When did I that start? Out? Oh, a long time ago. It worked out. I started working out really for, for health most, reasons. No, I got divorced. So I, I said, I got to get in shape. You know? So that I'm I a bachelor can date. Now. I'm a bachelor now. I got a date. So, and I've just done it ever since. And, you know, I get encouragement from my doctor and I get encouragement from. So what do you do? Uh, I work out, you know, I treadmill and I uh, stairs and weights and the Sit whole ups. deal, the whole deal. It doesn't work. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> I know what but you I mean. do it. <laughs> but now in school, did you play any sports well? I just can't imagine um, you as kind of a sports guy, although you have yeah, the 4th of July I, picnic. I grew up a very kind of, even though I grew up in the middle of California, I grew up in a very Midwestern, you know, I played football. I didn't play it on the, the football team in high school, but we'd go to the park every Sunday, and all the kids would get together and play football. Played Little League. I did play Little League for a long time. And uh, when I got into high school, I was on the tennis team, and I played tennis. So. Really? You don't still play it? I don't have time to play it. I have a tennis court. I just never get there anymore. It's terrible. You know, I, I, part of it is that, you know, I have three kids, and three, whatever my work uh, doesn't consume, they, uh, they definitely consume. So I've had to cut back on my work considerably just because they consume so much more than my work do, or does. So are you really good at flirting? Flirting? I'm terrible. I've never been very good at flirting. It's not my thing. I don't know whether it's because I'm shy or just because uh, uh, I don't think that way, but I've never... You're not that as, as shy anymore, though, but in, maybe in that area then? You don't have a pickup line? No. I don't but have a you are. Line. You embody a pickup line. George Lucas, yeah. you kind of don't have but to. But many of the women are afraid of me, so that they, they sort of hover, but they never come close. And so you know, what would you generally have to do then? You have to put have them to, at ease. Yes, I look at so them. So that's the flirting then. You just put, <laughs> put them at ease. Yes. yes. So I can, I can look and I can smile and um, I can get them to come over. and I don't have to have a pickup line. At least not anymore. That's luxurious. Yes, isn't it? And you went to the Playboy Mansion. I've been to the Playboy Mansion a few times. I know it was on television. Yeah, you were I know. supposed to meet me, and you went to the Playboy Mansion instead. I, know. I was devastated. But it wasn't. And yet, it wasn't for the women. I was working. 
I was trying to save motion pictures. Excuse me? I was trying to save motion pictures. It was for the Film Foundation to try to rescue the films that are being destroyed. At the Playboy Mansion? Yes. You don't have to explain. Hugh Hefner and I have some things in common. Not just that? (laughs) Tell me, please tell me what. the uh, no no he that was a that was a uh, benefit for the film foundation you know Marilyn Monroe's 75th anniversary that sort of thing but they were giving me a lot of money to to the film foundation which but, is so why I was there because I'm on the, the board of directors and I did it yeah. after that uh, not really I'm, no you, know, you didn't my LA I come to your parties that's it that is my entire Hollywood experience that's your Hollywood party that is my Hollywood experience and how how do you like that party I love that party you have the best parties of course. I wouldn't travel all the way down there if they weren't the best parties. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'm so flattered. I'm so (laughs) delighted. So when you first, so you just went into working out when you first went into back to dating? Yeah, pretty much. Before that I was working and before that I was also, um, you know, I mean, I I got divorced when I was sort of late 30s, you know, pushing 40 and so... Uh, my age was catching up with me, so to speak. Before that, I was a skinny kid. Remember when I was directing Star Wars? I mean, I was really skinny. And you, you were know, I weighed like 127 pounds. And you, yes, and you were unbelievably quiet. Well, that's, I think, more mythology than real. <laughs> so was you, your father was strict? Uh... My father wasn't strict. My father was firm. You know, a lot of people have tried to, you know, especially the media, try to say, oh, you know, your father must be Darth Vader. And it's not like that at all. My father was, uh, you know, uh, That's very pretty simplistic. Well, the media is extremely simplistic. But, um, you know, my father was very firm. And he was very, you know, he, uh, my mother was actually ill a lot. So I was raised a lot by my father. And, um, uh, and so were my sisters. And, um, you know, he was, he had rules, and, but in the end he was uh, uh, being a reasonably conservative guy and pretty firm. He was very, uh, very fair. You know, it, uh, um, when, I, when all of us, all the kids of us think back on being raised, we sort of have this, you know, the bark and the, the bark of my father, which is what everybody has the bark of their father, you know. And then you have the reality of it, which is what did he actually do? Right. You know, and, uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, my sisters came in after 11 o'clock or something, you know, you don't come in. But at the same time, uh, uh, you know, one of my sisters, when she was 13, was dating a, a, a kid who was 17. And, and uh, you know, it's, just, it is a, it's sort of a disconnect when you think about it. And I think about it with my daughters. I say, how did my daughter, how did my dad... Do this. And but that was okay with him? It was okay with him. He was a good kid. You know, they ended up getting married, lived happily ever after. But, you know, it's still wow. when you think about, when I think about my 13 year old daughter going out with a 17 year old. Nowadays. Kid, yeah. Was, well, but it was, it was just as powerful then. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, the things changed that much in terms of those kinds of Did issues. Did he tell you about the facts of life or your mother? Uh, my dad did. He did? Yeah. I mean, he didn't go into great detail. When you were what age? Uh, I guess I was about 11 or 12. What did you think about it? And that's it was old, boring. It? it was sort of like, you know, sex education in school. It wasn't like, you know, I mean, now you get it in school. And we then did eventually get it in high school. But now most kids get it in junior high school. God, they learned But it was it the so same young. thing. And of course, now it's in all music and, you know, it's everywhere. It's on, it's on the radio. Yeah. I mean, how old have you told your kids about all that? How old were they? Mm, well, uh, we've dis- we, I've got two daughters that have reached that age. So I've got an eight-year-old boy, but I haven't talked to him about it yet. I've talked to him a little bit. We've had some conversations because he's been exposed to certain things. And he, when he comes with questions and everything, I give him you know, as clear an answer as I can possibly give him. Um, and uh, so he knows the, the, the basics, and then he comes to me with questions. And it's pretty much... Uh, with my daughters, it's, uh, uh, they preferred actually to, to learn more about it in school, in their class, and with their peers than they did to have dad sit down and uh, try to explain it to them. You know, I said, do you want to, shall we sit down and talk? No, dad, we don't want to, I already know about this. I learned it in school, and I know this. And 
They and like a, to be and, like that about it. And occasionally they'll ask a question or two and then I'll give them an answer. But, you know, I, I didn't sort of sit them down and push it on them. I, oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter came, uh, no, my, I came home from school in the third grade and I said, I saw something, I saw f written on the handball court. I said to my mother, what does that mean? And she said, I'll tell you later when I, I can draw you diagrams. <laughs> if only she'd drawn me those diagrams, I really feel like th that would have been very, very useful. Y you know how you always hated those people at the studio and everything? And they me? were always like the, no. like the authority people? And now authority you, aren't figures? you sort of like that? Now you're an authority guy, aren't you? No. Uh, yes. Not as much. Not as much. I don't do other people's movies. I only do my own movies. So therefore, I don't have to put myself in a position where I'm telling other people how to make their movies. But aren't you sort of in charge of kind of a land up here? Well, it's like a big family. It's not like a land. It's like a big family. And you're, you know, but you're, aren't you? And I am. Um, Grandpa I am, Walton? I am Grandpa <laughs> Walton. And uh, I, uh, you know, they're just as Grandpa Walton, there's a lot of little families, you know, a lot of little fathers, a lot of parents. Uh, but just like you intimidate and, women, don't you intimidate some of them or? Yeah, I mean, you know, I live in this strange world that any celebrity lives in, which is, um, you know, we all know we're normal, or at least some of us, <laughs> and uh, or at least we think of ourselves as normal, uh, and we're probably more normal than we think. Um, and then, uh, you know, people see us and they think we're these icons, these amazing things that, you know, aren't like them. And uh, I do a lot of a lot of um, uh, lecturing and stuff to kids and do a lot of stuff with schools and everything and it's the one thing I tell them is I said you get people because they're famous doesn't make them, that does not make them any smarter it doesn't make them uh, anything uh, except the fact that they have excelled at something and so you can appreciate what they've excelled at and maybe learn something about what they've excelled at but when it gets to anything else they're just like you they just they they like uh, you know chocolate ice cream they like Baths you know, or showers. Yeah, they like to take showers and baths, and they like to do anything that anybody else does, and they have the same problems that everybody else has. You know, it's not like the problems go away. So, don't, you know, suddenly think that when you're talking to somebody who's famous that they're, you know, you have to bow down and, you know, kiss their feet because it doesn't work that way. Well, there's different kinds of famous. There's the kind of famous where, you know, when sometimes when I'm with someone like Meryl, uh, who is a movie star, then people will look at her from afar. I mean, it's, it's not as invasive as television famous, which is people, you, you're in their homes. Yeah. So people can come right up to you and you're in their homes frequently, so they can come up, you they know. They feel very familiar with you. But you're not that variety. No, I'm the, not that variety, thank goodness. You know, I'm, I'm the variety of having little kids come up and shake in my presence and say, would you, Please sign this. Oh, and you know. what's the next one about? And well, some of them don't get that far. You know, they can barely get out. Would you please sign this? Because you're you know. the great and powerful Oz. Yeah, basically, I'm Oz. I'm, I'm the the funny guy behind the curtain. Study history in school. You studied filmmaking, right? No, I was a history major actually. You were? Yeah. In 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 high school, I was a history major. In my first couple years of college, I was an anthropology major, and then I became a film major. Anthropology? Yeah. I like to think about the way people are and why they think the way they are and why societies are the way they are. You know, it's always been my uh, sort of Achilles heel in terms of the things I like to spend. But you ended up with filmmaking. 
I ended up filmmaking because that's it combines all of my interests. You know, I started out in college. I say I started out as an anthropology major, uh, and then, uh, but at the same time, I liked art, and I really wanted to go to art center and become an illustrator. Uh, and so uh, Can I had you picked draw? up. Uh, not very well. Not around a lot of people that intimidate me because they're geniuses. But the uh, uh, I ended up taking up photography, so I was interested in, in photography, and I was doing photography while I was doing, um, you know, while I was in my college and everything. And so I couldn't get into Art Center because my father wouldn't pay for it because he said no artists in our family. And so I said, and he said, you can do it yourself. You know, go out and get a job, and it's uh, one of the more expensive schools. So I wasn't. You know, really attuned to doing that. Um, and then I was going to go to San Francisco State and just become an anthropology major. And a friend of mine was going to USC and he said, hey, they got a film school. You, know, you learn how to take pictures and stuff. And he said, it's not quite art school, but it's like somewhere in between there. And so I said, okay, I'll do that. And I, so I ended up. And your father was okay with that? It was because I was going to USC. It was a big university. The major was sort of a, a minor consideration at that point. So. Um, I got there. I didn't know what it was. I thought I was going to learn still photography and um, realized that there was a school to learn how to make movies. I thought so that you was weren't completely, like... That was completely insane. I said, why? There's a school to learn how to make movies? This is nuts. But once I got there, I loved it. I just fell immediately in love with it. And I said, uh, discovered very quickly that I said, I know how to do this. And I love doing this. And uh, within one semester, I was uh, you know, winning film festivals and having a great time. So you weren't like a film buff as a child or anything like that? No. Wow, that's riveting. You know, I watched my share of television, but not that much. Uh, so you didn't go to me. like foreign films. You didn't, uh, go, you didn't see all that. You saw I didn't that. Even see, you know, I would go see The Blob and go see, uh, <laughs> you know, but basically we went to, you know, chase girls and hang out. We never actually went to, we, to watch the movies. So you're like a big girl chaser? No, I wasn't. I mean, all boys go to movies to chase girls. That's why you go to movies. You do? Or you used to. Yeah, when you're a teenager. You, know, How do you, you go to the movies hoping you're going to meet some cute chick and like sit in, in front of them or sit behind them. No, you go sit behind them and you tease them and you flirt with them. And, you know, and then you get to sit next to them and you go. Make I mean, out. Yeah. Did you go to, ever go to a make out party? Mm, uh, not really. I mean, I went to parties that turned into make out parties, I guess, a little bit. But not that much. I mean, everybody sort of wander off and do their own thing kind of stuff. Spin the bottle. I mean, I, I grew up in the, in the uh, late 50s, early 60s in that period. So life didn't really become uh, crazy until I really got into college, you know, which was sort of, you know, 60, uh, what it really happened is when like in 64, things started to heat up quite and a bit. And you, you never got involved in any of the stuff that I, of course, got involved in. I did that for you. Yes, and I thank you for that. I That's okay. You could have avoided it yourself, but at the same time, uh, I am very thankful that I missed out on all that. You and did I missed nothing. out on it. I did nothing. I know. And I, and I missed out at the most intense period in time. But I part know. Of it That's was, what's amazing. But part of it was a lot of my friends were getting involved in it. And um, uh, one, I got, I'd got this. Is, it all started to really, the drug thing really started to happen uh, in the mid '60s when um, when I was in film school, and I was just completely obsessed with film. And then I s saw a lot of my friends in college and sort of sort of dropping by the wayside and uh, having problems in their lives and stuff because of it. And I just said, you know, I just I'm just not going to go there. And and I, you know, I never drank much. I mean, I got drunk a few times, threw up, and said, this is stupid. I'm not going to do this. Um, my parents drank quite a bit. You know, they're from the 30s and the 40s, and a whole period where people drank, uh, like not, to, not not to having a problem. Yeah, but just you know, having cocktail after dinner and that sort of thing. But um, and they smoke like crazy. Oh, but really? None of I have three sisters. None of us smoke. None of us drink. None of us ever did drugs. It just isn't in the. It's funny because it just isn't what we do. You weren't a hippie. I was not really a hippie. I mean, I wasn't. I mean, I didn't drop out and join a commune. And you know, the big, biggest thing we did is we went to San Francisco. We sort of formed a film commune, you know, a film manifesto kind of uh, uh, thing. And I was involved more in the social movements of the time than I was in the drug movements of the Which time. Which was uh, anti-war, you know, uh, free speech, uh, you know, integration. There were a lot of issues going on in those days that. 
that I was involved with, but not in the uh, sort of hippie, uh, you know, get stoned and listen to music and, you know, not that I didn't go to a lot of those concerts and things, but. And you went to concerts and stuff. Yeah. What kind of music did you like? And uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, The Doors, Jimi Hendrix, and you know, sort of the normal stuff that everybody was involved in. But you really period. like music. I mean, do I you love music. I love music. I love rock and roll. I love all kinds of music, but, and I especially loved that particular period of music. And I love the 50s music, you know, 50s rock and roll. I grew up, you know, from the point of, of Elvis on, I guess, uh, Fats Domino and Elvis, I was there. And, you know, but I was only like nine or 10 years old, but I love that music. Maybe, baby, I'll have you. Maybe, baby, you'll be true. Maybe, baby, I'll have you for me. It's funny, honey. You don't care, you never listen to my prayer. Bring him before us, then. Well, you've created universes, though. I mean, what, what even started you thinking you would do that? What, what a weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> Were you into science fiction? No, I'm not a science fiction person at all. I mean, so, I... I like science fiction in that it gives you a forum to discuss social issues without the intensity of, of the sort of uh, folk reality that exists around most So you can issues. do that Roman stuff. Yeah, and, and uh, that's why I like history. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, science fiction is just another way, or I'm not really in science fiction at all. I'm more in the fantasy land right. of things. Mythology. And there's a very different world. but. I do it because I want to be able to discuss issues, philosophical issues and otherwise, without, the, uh, without a lot of the uh, floats and jetsam that sort of comes around a contemporary issue that, that makes people close their minds to the, to the subject matter. So you were in school and you made THX, so that was like the first, is that the first thing that you did? That was the student film? Well, I'd done a lot of student films by that time, but that was really, actually it was my last student film, uh, and it became you know, very popular and won a lot of film festivals and everything. And then I, uh, because I won some scholarships and things and worked, began to have some opportunities at studios, I took that and said, I'm going to try to make this into a feature. And that was a very funny time in the film industry. It was sort of just on the very end of that whole, whole phenomenon that happened. And then that phenomenon, after, after all the blockbusters of The Godfather, the Star Wars, the Jaws, and all those kinds of movies, and more theaters were built, and more, uh, you know, independent distributors came out. They started allowing more filmmakers to have that freedom again. But then, as that moved on, then they added more and more people to it, and ultimately, it's become just like the studios, where you have 15 people second guessing your movie all the time. And do you identify with anybody in these these films of yours? Who do, do you identify in somebody in Star Wars? I know it's not me. Yeah, it is. It's me, <laughs> in, the, in the weird dress and the hairstyle. Yeah, I've always wanted to have that hairstyle. You tortured me with that hairstyle. And I, I was know, too frightened that I you were going to fire me because of the 10 pounds overweight that I acquiesced. That's why. Oh. Now it can be told. You said, Did you, do you like it? What do you think you said? <laughs> and I said, it's, it's really okay. nice. It's really yeah. nice. Well, um, that hairdo was designed to be noticed. And, oh, it, and it was good. noticed. <laughs> that was the point. That was, uh, you don't put a wider hairstyle on I'm, an already wide I'm, face. You put the hair like here. This, <laughs> and it would have been noticed. Yeah. Yeah, well, the thing of it is it started out, um, actually in the new film, you'll see the way it started out. Oh, because you, she, yeah. she wears that hairstyle only done, it, look, it done, that, that done, the way, done the way it was originally intended. But that, it ended up, being modified and brought down and becoming more pretty, you know, braids and you know yours. Yours is the one that got smaller and smaller. When you see hers, it's like like this, but like that, two giant that horns girl on the other side. Beautiful girl. But you were beautiful girl. You were beautiful in the movie. Point at the deck. So now you put her in S and M clothes. You have some weird, creepy little S and M thing going on, George. <laughs> <laughs> I am now what the S and M. Well, I'm an S&M joke a on Friends. 
I, I guess. That's not S and M. Come on, that's. Sort well, you of said bikini. now. You said that this. You know, right. the, she's in a weird outfit now too. Well, she is actually. You she, she's, my... she's in more S and M than you were, but we were in harem. You know. But it was the chains and the killing of the slug is very S and M these days. Really? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I, I you thought know, you were just killing a slug. I just missed the outer edge of the S and M scene. Yeah, I'm no, so I, upset. I, that I may have been naive, but I sort of missed that that angle on the whole thing. It's, I, I mean, it's I knew there was a little, bit of, a little bit of metal work in the suit and everything, but it, you know, it was uh, sort of appropriate to the to the time period that we were dealing with. I like that with. you like sort of stronger women. They seem sort of pissed off strong, but you know, they're stronger. Well, you were funny besides being, you know, you were strong. And you were only really pissed off at Harrison. You weren't really, you know. Hey, you talking to f***ing me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was pissed off at Harrison. Yeah, you couldn't be pissed off at Mark. But you had to be. But that was the whole point, obviously. Well, I like that was like the his girlfriend. That was, that was, yeah, you had to have this kind of tension between the so two So you of didn't you. identify with anybody except uh, me. Well, I mean, I think if, if it was anyway, probably with Mark because, you know, he, is the he, he, was the, he was the guy I would make a movie about. out of time jerk. we have to <laughs> and it's been a, my pleasure too <laughs> You're a so are you hey you're talking to me <laughs> <laughs> all right this I is the way we write together this is the, yeah this when we were writing really together we i'd say i got this great idea what if she she jerk <laughs> and I would break your yeah, thought. Yeah, you break my thought. But it ended up being your thing anyway. You got your way. No, it's I didn't. Way. No, I didn't. It was a shared responsibility. You modified my overly flowery romantic tendencies. Um, and made it all ironic and crazed like I am. I was going to ask if I could be buried here. Not after I'm dead, but, you know, buried recently. Yeah. Not, just leave my head out. No, What's that one there? It's a vineyard. The, up at the very top is uh, olives. For olive oil, that's the vineyard. And then the house? Pinot Noir, uh, Chardonnay, and Merlot. You could have put your glasses back on. Because I just wear mine all the time now. I feel smarter. It warns that. people that I'm really, really smart. Because um, I, don't, I, I want see. them to be prepared. I, I can't hear you. <laughs> but if, I, if I have my glasses on, at least I can see you. That's going to happen next, the collapse of hearing.